Lord. Go in your Bibles to Joshua chapter number 11. You can be seated. Joshua chapter number 11. And uh, you got to watch me careful tonight. I'm struggling with my voice. All right, we're good. Can you hear me out there all right? Good. All right. Joshua chapter number 11. And uh, thank God. Good crowd tonight. Amen. Amen. A three-day weekend. And here you are, faithful and just serving the Lord. I appreciate you so much. God is so good to us. And uh, I'm, I'm going to preach a message tonight I don't want to preach. I didn't have a choice in it. I'm preaching through the book of Joshua. And I've come to this difficult chapter where I just, it was like the Holy Spirit put a hook in my jaw and wouldn't let me go. It would have been easy for me, Pastor Brandenburg, to just kind of roll into the next message. By the way, the next message in this uh, expository study through the book is, is honestly going to be one of my favorite. I, I can't wait to preach the next message out of Joshua. And uh, it's probably the most boring part of the whole book. Uh, it, it's six chapters of nothing but information. But there's some gold nuggets in that that I'm telling you is just thrilling. That'll be the, for the next message. You've got to endure tonight's message. As a matter of fact, I'm going to tell it to you this way, Brother Mike. We're going into the deep end of the pool. Most Christians don't like that. Most Christians are tolerant of a little surface, make me feel good. Just give me something to think about. Don't go deeper than I can handle. And, and, and I'm not purporting myself as someone who has the ability to go into the deep end of the pool. I'm telling you this, though, it's in the study. This is one of the benefits of book studies is that you have to deal with difficult passages. I don't know anyone, any preacher, that would ever purposefully, purposefully go to the text that I'm preaching tonight just to preach it. I don't know any preacher would do it. So I'm going to need your attention. I'm going to need you to sit up straight and give, give, give me... Uh, 35 minutes of undivided attention. Can you do that with me tonight? And, and with the Lord's help, look at this, this difficult passage of Scripture. As a matter of fact, there's not just one difficult passage of Scripture we're going to look at, but two, three, and even four different difficult passages of Scripture that uh, you probably have not heard five sermons out of either of the four messages that I'm going to bring tonight. I'm not saying that to commend myself. I'm just trying to let you know this is a rough one. Are you okay? Now, if you want to get up and leave, go right ahead. Uh, we'll know what your spiritual life is all about. Amen. Just, uh, just, just you. Uh, I'm struggling already to get into this because I, I feel a little disconnected in the, the crowd to me tonight. I just, I feel like we, we need the Lord tonight. We need the Lord tonight. We've had a great day and fired up day and I just loved every bit of the service today. I really did. But tonight we're going to go deep. And I need you to listen. And I need you to say, God, speak to my heart. Let's pray. Father, now help me. Uh, Lord, you know I'm nervous about preaching this. I'm nervous every time I preach. But Lord, this, this is a difficult message. And I'm praying that you'll anoint what's said. And may it be a help to everyone here. Lord, it might be a, there may be even a church member here tonight who, as Brother Rick said in his testimony, it was his last invitation. That could be the case. So God, I pray that you'd use this message to touch every person. In Jesus' name, we pray, amen. Before we read the text and get into the message, let me give you some background of how we got to the 11th chapter of Joshua. You remember Moses, the servant of God, died. God told Joshua, you're on. God commended him. God gave him everything he needed. And so Joshua becomes the new leader. The first thing they did is they crossed the River Jordan. They went across Jordan on dry ground. Say amen. That's amazing. The first thing they encounter is that great city of Jericho, that walled city of Jericho. And they were told to find the process of going into the possession. And that process included six times around the city. And on the seventh time around the city, how many times? seven times. And so once they did that, they blew the trumpets, the priests blew the trumpets, the people shouted, and the walls fell flat. The next was the city of Ai. 
And there was a city where Israel was slacking. After the great victory came a great defeat. And so 36 men were killed because of uh, Joshua's failure to pray and the people's failure to seek God. And, and so because of callousness and carelessness, there was the first defeat. But soon after, victory was found. And then, Mo then Joshua leads the children of Israel uh, 30 miles into the center of Canaan and there between Mount Ebal and Mount Gershom there the covenant was read one side of the mountain range were the curses the other side of the mountain range were the blessings and the people said amen and amen and they reconfirmed the covenant that was with Moses and of course now with Joshua and the people the last time I preached out of the book of Joshua we dealt with the sun and the moon standing still what a tremendous miracle that was uh, when God allowed uh, the celestial bodies to obey his mighty command. Joshua then was able to defeat the enemies of God and a great victory was wrought that day. And so we, we covered all those great events and now we come to this passage in the 11th chapter where I'll draw your attention to verse number 18. And we'll read just a few verses here and then get into uh, the introduction of the four points that I'm going to bring tonight with four different texts. And we'll bring those up on the screen in just a moment. Verse number 18. So Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel. I want you to just remember that. That's quite a statement. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel. Say the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon. Remember that message we talked about the Gibeonites? how they established a peace and a covenant with Israel. And all others, look at all other, they took in what, church? Battle. Battle. Look at verse 20. This is the verse. This is an amazing verse. This is the, the difficult verse. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly and that they might have no favor but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. You see how difficult that verse is? That's an uncomfortable verse. I'm going to tell you that is just a downright disconcerting verse. It causes me great tension that God himself hardened their hearts. Why? that they might be destroyed utterly. It's a difficult thing to swallow. This goes so contrary to our expectation of God, but there has to be something here for you and for me tonight to learn from. I'm going to help us understand that tonight by going to other passages of Scripture. And on the screen you'll see these passages. And I'm putting these up here tonight just so you have comfort. You say, why comfort? I want all four of them up there if you can. Because when I hit the first uh, point, you know that that's the first quarter of the message. Then I get to the second one, we're hitting halfway. So when I talk uh, out of Romans chapter 9, you can say, praise the Lord, he's halfway done. When I get to Hebrews chapters 3 and 4, now you notice chapters 3 and 4, that's uh, quite a few verses there. But you'll be able to say at that point, I'm three quarters done. When I get to 2 Thessalonians, man, I'm getting ready to hit home plate. And so you stay with me tonight as we look at these four passages of Scripture tonight. The message is titled this, The God-Hardened Heart. When God hardens the heart. When God hardens the heart. I want you to think with me tonight about, first of all, the purpose of this. Would you just think with me as, as uh, can you imagine being in Canaan? Now we're talking about processing your possession. The process includes several things we've talked about. But tonight, God says this, to process your possession, I'm going to harden some hearts. This is a difficult thing to understand. I, I want you to think about with me now, strategically, militarily, and then just simply logically. As you think about Joshua uh, going to Jericho and destroying Jericho and no one living except Rahab and her family. 
Then he goes to AI, and all of AI is destroyed, and I mean, everything gone, burned to the ground. He goes to Lachish, and he goes to, uh, to uh, uh, Jer Jerusalem, and all the different kingdoms, and we see them in order as they fall like dominoes. And it's interesting to me, it's, it's actually perplexing to me, how is it that while Joshua is beating and beating and beating and winning and winning and winning, that along the way somebody didn't stop and say, hold it, hold it, I surrender. But nobody did. Not one king. As a matter of fact, as Joshua kept wading into the promised land, the, the, the opposition just got fiercer. There was the collaboration of the five kings. Then it happened again. And all these kingdoms come together and they, they, they collaborate and confederate together. And, and nobody said, listen, this is a lose-lose for me. I want to be like the Gibeonites. Nobody did. You might ask yourself, well, why is that? Were they stupid? Not at all. Were they ignorant of what was going on? Read the text. They knew exactly what was going on. They knew that they were about to be destroyed without a question. They knew that the Jews were merciless in their destruction. The sword of the Lord, or the sword of the Jew would destroy these people. And I know this is difficult for us to process, but God was saying, I want them utterly, utterly destroyed. And these people knew it was coming, but not one of them. Read the text. Not one of them. Let's, let's look at this long passage of Scripture. Start in chapter 10. Go back to chapter 10 and look at verse, verse 28. I'm just going to give you some highlights. It says, And at that day Joshua took Makeda and smote her with the edge of the sword, and the king thereof he utterly destroyed them and all the souls that were therein. He let none remain. Look at, uh, uh, look at uh, the next passage there, uh, verse, uh, verse, verse 13. Uh, no, I'm chapter 10, I'm sorry. Verse uh, 30, it says, And the Lord delivered it also, and the king thereof the hand of Israel. He smote it with the edge of the sword uh, and, and let no souls remain in it. Verse 31, chapter 10, And Joshua passed to Libna, and all Israel with him unto Lachish. And he, verse 32, he, and the Lord delivered Lachish, and he smote it with the edge of the sword. Look at the redundancy of this. It's bloody, it's brutal, it's for sure. Look at verse 33. Horem, king of Gezer, Joshua smote him and let, left none remaining. Verse 34, Lachish, Joshua passed to Eglon and, and he smote it, verse 35, with the edge of the sword. He utterly destroyed that day. Joshua went to Eglon, verse 36, unto Hebron. And they fought against it, and they smote it with the edge of the sword, and left none remaining. Do you see it again and again and again and again and again? Verse 38, Joshua returned to Derby, fought against it, smote them, edge of the sword. Verse 40, Joshua smote all the country of the hills, and of the south, <coughs> and of the vale, and of the springs, and all their kings. He left none remaining. He utterly destroyed all that breathed. Verse 41, and Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea unto Gaza, the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. All these kings, all of them destroyed. And you come to chapter number 11. And you can keep doing this all the way down through verse number 23. It's just he takes and takes and takes and takes. And it's just amazing to me as you see this. Not one of those kingdoms sought peace. Not one. How many tonight would think... Somebody might have said, I quit, I give up. It just seems like along the way, somebody might have laid their swords down and said, this is nuts. We're, we're done for. But not one of them. So why didn't they do this? Why didn't some of these kings, Brother Nelson, why didn't one of them surrender? Doesn't this perplex you a little bit? I read this again and again and again in my uh, studying for this message and getting ready for this message and uh, actually through, for this whole series and I just couldn't process it. It was just amazing to me how on earth could these kings at some point say, not say, hey, listen, let's talk about this. No, they got stirred and they fought and the only way, Brother Tim, the only way we can understand this is verse number 20 of chapter 11. And smack dab right there in that verse, it was of the Lord to harden their hearts. 
that they should not, uh, the, but that they should come against Israel in battle. In other words, the Lord hardened their hearts to make them want to fight. And if they fought Israel, what was the outcome? Complete destruction. This is amazing. This is a tense passage of Scripture. It's something that's hard to process. So we have to, we have to think about this. Am I reading in the passage here that God himself put these people in line for destruction and God gave them no course of mercy and that God took from them any opportunity of survival and add to it that God even took out of their hearts a desire for peace? It's exactly what the text is teaching. It's uncomfortable. If you're not uncomfortable at this point, you're not listening to me. Because this is absolutely very tense. We read this and, and we don't understand. How can these nations not surrender? The answer is again, God wouldn't let them. God took it from them. God hardened their hearts. Now here's, we're going a little deeper now. Everybody all right? Just keep breathing. If God did that to the Amorites in Canaan, does God still do that today? Could it be? Now listen, if God did it to them, could he do it to me? Could he do it to you? See, see, see this is, this, we say we believe in eternal book, and it is eternal. If these truths are eternal, we better buck up and listen. Because God can harden our hearts. He did it here. I'm going to show you a little bit. God did it quite a bit. In fact, he did it more than once. Uh, so let's just break this down. The question being, could God do this now? Well, do what? Harden their hearts? Look at what it says in verse 20. This is an interesting phrase here. It says, uh, it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle, that he might destroy them utterly. Watch this. And that they might have no favor. Don't you love the King James? Favor. That word favor there is not on God's part, it's on their part. God took out of their hearts any desire for mercy. That desire for favor is on them. And so there was no pleading from them. It was completely gone. So God gave them a hard heart. God took their favor away, that is, that they would seek favor, any kind of mercy, no desire for mercy, uh, notice what it also says, that, they would, he would, uh, that Israel would totally destroy them, utterly destroy them. Uh, what does it say? Verse 20 says, that, that, but that he might destroy them. Uh, no, no, or, uh, the phrase above, he might destroy them. Look at the adverb, utterly. You see that word utterly? That word utterly means this, completely and absolutely. That they would be destroyed without any recovery. Pretty deep, isn't it, church? And then he repeats it. He says, destroy them again. So the redundancy here, the use of the adverb utterly, uh, the removal of favor and hardening of the hearts is all the action of God. No amens. No amens. Makes me wonder, God, do you still harden hearts today? God, do you still harden hearts today? I hope everybody's listening. Could, could God set you, could God set me on a course of action for my destruction? Could, could it be that, that, that God could take from me concern? Or, or uh, the word here is favor? Could God take from my heart desire for mercy and allow me to be set in a course for destruction? According to the Bible, God does this. It is rare. And the truth is, rare or not, I should be concerned about what God could do to me. I know, I know. I knew it's going to be quiet. And it's okay. Listen, church. We're not pretenders here. We're not pretenders. 
We want to know what does this book say? And tonight we're looking at that phrase, the hardening of the heart. This is very reaching and seeking to us tonight. It's very reaching and seeking because ironically, the reaching and seeking is what's missing in Canaan. They're not reaching for God. They're not seeking God. God hardened their hearts. These nations in Canaan were locked into fighting it out. Uh, as, as Joshua went from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom, he met with resistance and greater resistance, even though his victory was absolute. His victory was predictably absolute. There was no faltering. After AI, listen, after AI, it was one victory after another. There was no staggering. There was no stumbling. Uh, they went from kingdom to kingdom to kingdom, and they won, and they won, and they won. And along the way, nobody saw it peace because God hardened their hearts. Let me, let me make a statement here. Hard-hearted people do not see their need for mercy. Hard-hearted people do not see their need for favor. They don't see it. I have dealt with a lot of hard-hearted people. Have you? Have you? You ever talked to hard-hearted people? They're not seeking peace. They want to fight. And I'm going to develop that tonight with the Lord's help. Uh, I, I got to thinking about 2015 uh, coming from the Northeast. And I like to run as well. Uh, the Boston City Marathon. You remember that, 2015? You remember that, that, that boy and brother, there's two brothers, the Sernavs, I think is how you say it. T-S-A-R-N. AEV, these two boys, uh, immigrants, uh, American citizens as well. In 2000, uh, pardon me, I said 2015, that's when he was sentenced. 2013 is when they set off those bombs and uh, injured 280 people, killing four people on that beautiful day in April. Should have been a nice day. But those bombs were set, and, and Sarnav, uh, Sarnav set, uh, sat in 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 trial, was later condemned to death, uh, life in prison that is, and uh, the prosecutor, when the trial was ending and the sentencing phase begun, the prosecutor showed a photo of this convicted murderer and terrorist, and they had a picture of him sitting in his jail cell, and the security camera took a picture of him, and he was sitting there knowing that he was being filmed, and he stuck his middle finger up as if to say, that's what I think of you. Why would I say that and give that crass illustration? Because you're hearing about a hard-hearted individual. Uh, I, I read the interview of a girl whose legs were blown off that day. A runner lost both legs. A hard-hearted awful killer and I'm saying he was a cold-blooded killer as a matter of fact the prosecutor said after that photo was uh, <coughs> introduced at the sentencing part uh, the, the prosecutor said that he is an unrepentant and unchanged cold-blooded killer and one of America's worst nightmares no one here disagrees that that's a hard-hearted person but a hard-hearted person doesn't seek mercy they seek no recourse. There's no seeking for mercy. So first we consider tonight, what is the purpose of this, this, this recording here in verse 20? Why would God tell us that he hardened their hearts? Why is it that there was no seeking for mercy? Surrender was removed from them. Why would God do that? Why would God do that? Let's consider the definition of the word hardened. And this says a lot. This is 1828. To have a hardened heart, here's what it means. It means to make hard or harder. To make callous. Here's, here's the catch definition. To confirm in disposition feelings or action. Here's what it means. God said this. I've given you mercy and mercy and mercy and mercy. And I've given you opportunity to realize that my people are coming. But you wouldn't change. You wouldn't repent. So God said, I'm going to put you in a disposition. I'm going to put you in a course of action because I'm going to show my mighty power. 
You say, Pastor, that seems very unkind of God. Before you condemn God, let me remind you, God can do anything he wants to do. And he doesn't need our approval. And he doesn't need our agreement. Little man, little girl, little boy, little woman. You think that, that God is somehow going to modify himself? I listen to these pipsqueak fools out here today trying to tell us that God is for abortion and God understands homosexuality and God understands LBGTQ. I'm telling you, there's a hot spot in hell for people who want to make God awkward. You see, God will harden the heart. That's exactly what he's doing confined to a particular will or direction of action. That's what the hard heart is. I'm going to say it again. The hard heart is someone that God confines to a particular will or direction of action. I want to tell you what's going on on TikTok. There's a lot of young people getting hard hearts they're getting on there and committing themselves to a lifestyle. And they're getting harder and harder. Come on, church. We're not saying amen or that's right because we like it. It's just like ice. It gets harder and harder and harder and harder. And God will but not be made a fool. I'm saying this course of action is from the Lord. Are you still with me tonight? Yes. This, is, this is big boy preaching. Amen. And I don't feel qualified to do it, but I want to tell you something. You're asking the same questions I've been asked as I read this. Pastor, are you telling me that God will not spare them even if they wanted mercy? That's not what I said. And that's not what the text says. This is where people get all confused. Are you telling me that if they wanted to get saved, God wouldn't save them? That's what some Calvinists would try to say. But catch it. There is no seeking for mercy. There is no desire for peace. Are you catching this? There is no inquest of what can we do to fix this and work this out. Oh no, it's this. Come on. Come on. Come on. And God says, okay, I'll make you harder. And that's what God does. They're hardened. The very idea of surrender is absent, essentially left to their destruction. And so we see first the purpose of this text. God is saying, yes, yeah, that's what I do. I harden hearts. Let's consider secondly the next verse uh, in Romans chapter 9. So if you could go over there. Now we'll go to Romans chapter 9. And I hope, I hope we've got some Bible students in this church. Amen. That when a preacher says go to Romans chapter 9, you're going to go like this. Oh boy. Because it's a tough passage. You tell me later if you've heard any preachers preach out of Romans 9 in the last 10 years. And I'm not saying I'm the one, uh, but I have to because it's part of this, this whole, whole subject. Romans chapter 9, as we look first of all at the purpose, second, let's, let's consider the ponderment. The ponderment. I want you to ponder. I want you to ponder for a moment. God says, I want you to ponder some things. In Romans 9, he gives us some serious ponderment. And look at these nations whose hearts were hardened, that God hardened. Was God unfair? Was God unjust? Well, Romans 9 gives us some ponderment. Look at verse 14, please. Could you look back up here just for a second? Is everybody all right? Say amen. amen. Oh, you you got to just at least let me know you're all right, because, man, I'm telling you, we're going deeper. I mean, we need some scuba gear here shortly. Because you're not going to like what you're going to hear. It doesn't fit our, our soft, woke, live, love, laugh. Everybody's great. You know, be happy. Smile. Huh. This, this stuff, stuff. Look what God says in verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. We're asking the question, is God unjust? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. 
And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Look at verse 17. You still with me, right, church? We're going to keep reading. I'm going to just stop and make a statement. Everybody just keep, keep in your Bibles. Verse, verse 17. We're Romans 9. Everybody's there. Look at verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Isn't there some Paul reaches clear back to Egypt. And he says, the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose, Pharaoh, have I raised thee up, that I might shew my power. Where, church? Who's the thee there? In Pharaoh. And that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore, now this is a wow verse. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy and whom he will, he hardeneth. Verse 19. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Now right there, there ought to be some thunder, some rumbling, and some woe. Who art thou that thou repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter, who's the potter, church? God. Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to shew his wrath, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering. Watch this. This is blow your socks off. With much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Verse 23, here's the question. Why? And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. Now, I want you to take the big picture look. If you'll look right back up here, we're going to hit it again. I got more to say, but I don't know if you can bear it. But I want you to catch this now. The big picture of the conquest of Canaan. God had basically three things in mind. We see it in this passage. Of what God wanted to do in Pharaoh, but not just Pharaoh, in Canaan. Everything God did to Pharaoh was to get the people of God into Canaan. How many plagues did God send to, it, to Egypt? Tell me, how many? Ten, ten. ten plagues. It wasn't that God was fishing around. Okay, I sent him three. He didn't do too well at three, so I'm going to send him four. No, God predetermined way before how many Pharaoh needed. Because God hardened his heart. God hardened his heart. And God is, is showing us here uh, that he wanted to demonstrate some things. Uh, the first thing God wanted to demonstrate was to show his wrath. Look at me and listen to me. God wants to show his wrath. Right now heaven is percolating with wrath. Around the throne of God is darkness and thunderings and lightnings. And there's coming a day very soon when the wrath of God will be poured out on this earth. God destroying those people in Canaan. God was showing his wrath against the idols of, e of, of Canaan, uh, the, 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 the rejection of truth and righteousness in Canaan, and God wanted to show his wrath. The second thing God wanted to do was demonstrate his power. Demonstrate his power. These little Jews coming out of Egypt, none of them knew how to fight. The only one who knew how to fight was Joshua. And Joshua fought with those people, trying to get them to do the right thing. But God showed his power. He rained down hail from heaven. Uh, he held the sun still and the moon still. And God showed his power. <laughs> That's what he was doing there. Showing his wrath, demonstrating his power. And watch this, manifesting his mercy. But let me ask you a question. How could God show any of that if everybody was surrendering? If when they went in, all, all 12 of the earth, 16 of those kingdoms, they just kept throwing down, throwing down, throwing down. Sorry, no, no, God had to demonstrate some things. 
You say, well, it sure seems unfair to me, Pastor, how God would do that, all of that happening because God hardened the hearts of these Canaanites and these Amorites and these Hittites and these Hivites. I want you to ponder something. Verse 20 ought to make every one of us, of Joshua chapter 11, verse 20 ought to make every one of us recognize something. Why were we born in this country? Why, why, Brother Josh, why was I allowed to be born in America? You, you, you be honest for a minute. And I'm for church planting. I planted a church in New England. I, I'm honestly all about church planting in America. But you be honest with me. You've got to find a dark, deep rock and somebody living under it to find somebody in this country that's never heard about Jesus Christ, never heard of the Bible, never heard a gospel song, a Christian song. I'm telling you, we live here. But why was I born here? I could have been an Amorite. I could have been one that God hardened hearts, Brother Alex. I could have been one. But what's the chance of a China, a Chinese person ever seeing a Bible? Well, be honest now. Oh, pastor, they're there. No, they're not. Uh, how about the Sudan? Poorest country on earth. People are absolutely starving to death in Sudan. Do you think they give a flying flip about the length of your hair as an independent fundamental Baptist? Do you think they give a flying flip whether you're premillennial or postmillennial? They've never even seen a Bible. But we get what we get. Isn't it ironic? Some of the hardest hearts in the world are right here. Are right here. Are right here. I went in this morning to a store to get milk. I went in just like this. Just like this. And people looked at me and did this. Hard-hearted. God said this, you've got more Sunday schools in the entire country of Canada in Berkeley County. You've got more preachers. You've got gospel music. You've got Christian radio. You've got gospel tracks everywhere you go. You've got more. And God says this, really? I'll send you all kinds of hardness. God's hardening the hearts of Americans. I don't mean to preach on that, but I can't hardly see that. I can't hardly say that without, without being honest with this text. I mean, I mean, you and I were born, how, how about being born a Muslim? <laughs> the devil doesn't like when I'm preaching. He's got a fly getting ready to go up my nose. You could have been born a Hindi or a pagan, but God lets you be born where you're born. You know what that ought to make us do? That ought to make us get off our blessed assurance, lift our hands to God in holy praise, and say, Lord, whatever you want of me, you've been so good to me. You've given me mercy and grace, even though I should have had a hard heart like those people of Canaan. But God reached down in mercy and gave mercy where there should have been hardness. Man, we ought to do backflips for Jesus. Amen? Amen, church? We ought, to, we ought to, listen, I don't care what the traffic is, we ought to come out on Wednesday night church. Uh, we ought to go soul winning. We ought to go grab gospel tracks. And you say, oh, not me. Yeah, you got a hard heart. Hardness. Hardness. So we see a ponderment. Did you make a conscious choice to be born in America? You sure didn't. Did, watch this. Did you choose to be born in a Christian home? But you got a Christian mom and dad, a grandma and grandpa, brothers and sisters, whatever your story is. Did you choose to be born in a world where there's Sunday school and Christian schools and youth ministries and spiritual helpers, including Christian radio and, and churches and pastors? Well, you could have been an Amorite. So I'm not an Amorite. But do you have a hard heart? You could be right here in the good old U.S. of A. And have a heart as hard as the Amorites. And guess what's coming? Utter destruction. Because that's what happens. The hardened heart is destroyed. 
It's just destroyed. I don't know if you can see that little image we've got there, that heart. That, 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 that pictures it. It's hard. This is the state of so many Christians' hearts. If you don't think I know what I'm talking about, try pastoring 36 years. Because what I fight against is the hard heart. My hard heart. The hard heart of the church today. I don't have time to take you to Exodus. But in chapters 4 through 14, you ready for this? 19 times it says in those chapters, nine times it says God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Two times it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And the rest of the times it's used in, uh, in, in the text there, it's used uh, as, as by the passive voice that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. What does that mean? He didn't seek God for surrender or help. Here's what he did. He just kept telling God no. No. So that's Paul. Paul reaches way back to Pharaoh in Genesis chapter 15. I got to have you go there because I'm, 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 I'm getting ready to go to the third point. But I need you to see Genesis 15. Is everybody still listening? Amen. Give me 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes. That's what the dentist says when he's drilling on you. <laughs> Amen? Some of us need some drilling. Some of us need some drilling. Genesis chapter 15, you've got to see this. God is speaking to Abraham. You know this text, God's telling Abraham that uh, God's going to bless him, but God says, now hold it, Abraham. I need you to see something. Look at verse number 13. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them they shall afflict them 400 years. All right, stop right there. Look up here. What land, what people is God telling Abraham about? Egypt. Abraham knew about Egypt at this point, but this is 800 years before it happens. And God is telling him, you're going to be there how many years, church? 400 years. Now look at verse 14. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. Now notice verse 16. This is important. Don't miss this. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Now watch this now. They did go into captivity in Egypt. 400 years Forty years later, they're coming into Canaan. You know what's going on? God says the iniquity's full now. You say, what's that got to do with the message? Here's what I want you to ponder. God said, go into Canaan and destroy every one of those people. And it's not like God said, I'm not giving them a chance. Could I tell you this? He gave them 400 years of chances. 440 years of chances. And listen, keep listening. And God said... 100 years, 200 years, 300 years, 400 years, 440 years, full, hard heart. And all of them were hard hearted. God did it to them. And God was not unjust because the iniquity was full. I wonder tonight is, are you getting pretty full on the iniquity thing? You say, why are you saying that to us, Pastor? Because you need to understand God did it then. He could do it now. Let me hurry along. We have the purpose. We have the ponderment. Let's look at the practice now. This is where it gets practical. Practical. <clears throat> Pardon me. Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Go all the way over. We're still staying with this whole thing about the hardened heart. You say, then why are we going to the book of Hebrews? Hebrews says a lot about it. This is really the practical. This is the practice part. We have the purpose, the ponderment. And here we have thirdly the practice. Chapter 3 now. In other words, what does this mean? Pastor, give us something for us now. This is where it comes in. Look at uh, verses 7 and 8. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today. Would you say it with me? Today. One more time. Today. So the Holy Ghost saith, today, if ye will hear his voice, verse 8, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation 
in the day of temptation in the wilderness. You want a cross reference? Put it right in your margin. Psalm 95. David said the same thing. So what's he saying to us here? Here's the practice. He says, he says today. Now listen to me. There's a pleading taking place here. He's saying today, don't harden your heart. Here's the good news. If you're hearing this message and, and the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, Paul is saying this today. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. So, so he says today. And there's a pleading. There's a begging. He's telling, don't do it tomorrow. Do it today. Why? Because tomorrow you might be hardened. You say, oh no, Pastor, I got this. No, you don't. You stay too long on the ice, it's going to get thicker. And it keeps getting thicker. And before you know it, you'll never get through. You don't want to get to that place where God says, God says, God says, I'm hardening you. Because then nothing is going to help you. Nothing. No one. You could bring John the Baptist in here. Watch this. You could bring, bring Christ Jesus himself. And you're like those people in Canaan. Nothing. He takes from you desire for peace. Desire for terms. You see, we see clearly in Hebrews verses 7 and 8, this, this pleading. Uh, keep going with me. Verse number 9. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation. God was grieved. Listen, if you're grieving him tonight, watch out. You're heading to a hardness. Do you see it, church? Grieve. He said, you grieved me. They do always err in their hearts. And they have not known my ways. Verse 11. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. God said to the people that fought with him, keep listening church, that, that, that wrestled with him in the wilderness, God says, there's no hope for you. You're going to die in the wilderness. Right. Folks, I don't want to die in the wilderness. I don't want to die with a hardness that God puts on us. Uh, verse, i got to hurry here. Verse uh, Where'd I stop reading? 11, verse 12. Now, take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you, watch this, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Keep that evil heart of unbelief because the evil heart of unbelief always ends up a hard heart. Now, verse, verse, uh, verse 13. But exhort one another daily while it is called day. Again, the day today. He says, well, it's day, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So we see something new here. We see one God hardens hearts, but what do we see here? What, what hardness? Sin. sin hardens us. Listen, you stay in sin too long, watch this, whether by action or by the mind, you'll get hard to it. Right. Now you can amen me right here. Amen. You know that's true. Let me ask you a question. Don't raise your hand. You ever stayed out of church for a lengthy period of time? I'm not talking about COVID. But you ever just lay out of church? It's not easy to get back in. As a matter of fact, some of you still aren't over your backsliding. You still got some stink inside you. You got some rot in you. And you got it when you were out of his will. And that rot set in on you. And there's a little hardness in your heart you're still dealing with to this day. You know what I'm talking about. I'm telling you, when you stay in sin too long, it's hard to get back. Get out of it. Get out of it. Get that mind out of you. That thinking out of your mind. You say, well, I, well I, I, want to, I want to explore this and be that and be this and do that. Yeah, you stay long enough, you're going to get hard. And nothing will get through to you. I've got children, and they have not always done what I wanted them to do. I'll tell you something, I warn them all the time. I said, I warn them all the time. That's what parents are supposed to do. 
are around them all the time. Don't stay too long in stupid thinking. Because I'm going to be blunt, you become stupid. Knucklehead. Yep. Dad, Mom, I just want to be this, do this. Uh -huh. You listen to me. The deceitfulness of sin will harden. Is that what it says, church? Yeah. Oh, it's your opinion, Pastor. My wife told me about a TikToker. She got her, she said, Can I just say something to everybody? Like she's got the world in her attention. Big mouth fools what she is. The fool has said in his heart, there's no God. I saw you look at your watch. Everything all right, preacher? You tell me, slow down, get out of here. When you look at your watches, I see it, by the way. Actually, he got a text. It's a football game, just one, I think. Amen. You said amen. My wife said this TikTok, TikToker. Anybody know what I'm talking about when I say TikToker? It's some kind of... Uh, computer thing, but uh, she got on and she said, can I just tell everybody, I'm so sick and tired of hearing you talk about your Bible, 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 why the Bible's against abortion, and God knew in the, in the womb, she said, can I just make it clear, I don't care about your Bible. Hard heart. Watch this, and God is doing it. You keep thinking a certain way long enough. Go ahead. Ponder that. We got to finish. I want you to see the priority now. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This will be quick. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And this dovetails right into what we're doing in Revelation. I didn't do this on purpose, but it sure fits. I told you that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Could somebody else think of somebody else God hardened the heart of that in the life of Christ? Who would it be? Raise your hand if you know who. Who's that? Judas. Judas. Is, always call him Judas Iscariot. Don't ever call him Judas. Because that defames every Judas that ever lived. Amen. But Judas. How about, how about another one? Pharisees were hard hearted, yeah. But let's think of one coming in the future. The Antichrist. That's going to be a hard hearted person. God's going to harden his heart. <clears throat> uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let's stand together, please. And I'm finishing. I'm finishing. I want to make sure you catch this final, final, final thought. Oh, I wish I could preach these words. I just want to read you now. Look at verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that ye not, be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter, as from us, as that day of Christ is at hand. Now that's future. Right, church? That's future. Let no man deceive you by any means. We're in the future. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. You could write in your Bible the Antichrist right there. Everybody still with me? Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshiped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that oh, when I was with you, uh, yet I told you these things. I look at verse 6. And now you know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his, in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Now the let and the letter here, the letter is the Holy Spirit. So what we're seeing here is he'll be taken out of the way and the Antichrist will be given power then. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the workings of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. Man, think of that. In them that perish, 
because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And here's what I want you to catch. And for this cause, God shall send them strong, what's the word there, church? Delusion that they should believe a lie. Do you know what he's doing here? In a tribulation, he's going to harden hearts. See, some of you are thinking, well, I'll, I'll get through. If I miss the rapture, I'll just go into the tribulation. And I won't take the mark of the beast and I'll be okay. You're not agreeing with what God said. Because I want to tell you something. It's going to be so horrible. You'll do anything you've got to do. You will take the mark of the beast. You will worship the Antichrist. And you'll go to the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. Because you've been hardened. I don't want to pastor people that might go to hell. I'm afraid our churches, Pastor Brandenburg, are populated with people whose hearts have been hardened. Say, why would, you, why would you preach this to us, Pastor? It's in the text. But I want to, I want to summarize and I'm done. I told you 10 minutes, 10 minutes ago. But let me just remind you this. Number one, we can never know when the heart is hardened by God. We can never know. That's why Paul said today, we don't know when he's going to harden our hearts. Number two, we can never know when sin will harden our hearts. How long are you going to stay in that sin? How far are you going to go? Really, how far are you going to go? Oh, Pastor, I got this. It's got you. We don't know when God will harden our heart. We don't know when sin will harden our heart. When the Antichrist comes, according to that Bible, I will become hardened. So here's the answer. Today. Say today. Today. Today, today stop hardening your heart. Stop it. Stop hardening your heart. Repent of sin. Listen. Repent of sin. I'm done with this. God will set you free. Stop hardening your heart. Stop believing lies. Stop listening to the TikTok crowd. Stop believing lies. And may I say to you, if you're not saved, get saved, because I'm telling you, you will not get saved in the tribulation. Let's bow together, please. The day of Christ is at hand. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. A heavy, heavy message. I didn't want to preach it. I really didn't. God knows my heart. But I wonder tonight, am I talking to a hard-hearted Christian? I, 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 I don't want to get personal, but could I just tell you something? It's showing. It's showing. It's funny how, how things happen to us and we think we don't get changed. You do change. You've changed and you don't even know it. My question is, have you become hardened? I remember losing my son. I say I lost him. He was taken from me. I changed. I honestly changed. I became darker. These two deep lines on the top of my nose literally happened in three months' time after my son's death because of constant, constant, unrelenting grieving. It changed me. But I'm here to tell you there came a time in my deep grief that I said, God, I don't want to have a hard heart from my darkness. And God heard my cry. I want to say to you tonight, if you have a desire for peace with God, God has not hardened your heart. You see, that's the difference. Cain and God took their desire for peace away. If you have a desire for God tonight, I want to invite you to come to this old-fashioned place of prayer and weep your way to Calvary and weep your way to the Savior's loving grace and weep your way to the Savior who will help you and lift you and give you comfort where there is no other comfort. Father, bless your people now. If there's someone here not saved, God, I'm praying you'll 
squeeze their heart to the point of agony that it drops them to their knees that God they can't do anything but turn to the loving Savior and be saved tonight I pray that you get victory in your saints hardness not God amen